Funding for Texas Monthly Talks is provided in part by Public Strategies Incorporated, managing campaigns for corporations around the clock, around the world, and J.P. Morgan Chase, the state's largest financial institution, serving large and small businesses, governments, schools, churches, and individual Texans just like you for more than 135 years, and the MFI Foundation, improving the quality of life within our community and the Matson McHale Foundation, in support of public television. And also by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, proud to be a founding partner of Texas Monthly Talks. And by the law firm and public policy practice of Vincent and Elkins, LLP, providing legislative, regulatory, and public finance counsel for complex business challenges. Vincent and Elkins, online at VELaw.com. And viewers like you, thank you. I'm Evan Smith, the editor of Texas Monthly. Thank God for this week's guest, though he wouldn't dare put it that way. Christopher Hitchens is, as he was described recently in the New York Times, a fervid atheist, and has been since before he even knew to call himself one. And he doesn't mind saying so, loudly. While the topic of one's lack of faith would be, for most writers, too sacred a cow to punch, the famously provocative Hitchens has no problem lacing up his gloves for any reason. And oh boy, has he done so in his new book, the rapidly best-selling God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. As the title suggests, the 58-year-old doesn't hold back in exploring the extent of his contempt for all things spiritual, including religion, organized and otherwise, which he views as a dividing, hectoring, and bullying force. Of course, there are those who read Hitchens' regular columns in Vanity Fair and Slate and see him as a divider, hectorer, and bully himself. And he might not disagree. The native of Portsmouth, England, and graduate of Oxford University has always laid it on the line, damn the consequences, whether the subject is women, whom he has written are not funny, Iraq, he passionately defends the war despite having once been a Marxist, Henry Kissinger, whom he brands a war criminal, or his friend Salman Rushdie, whose death threats by Islamic fundamentalists crystallized for Hitchens the point of view he's now expressing before throngs of fellow non-believers all over the country. But he also has a reputation for being hyper-intellectual, bitingly witty, and extremely charming. And he did not disappoint when he stopped by for a chat in mid-May. A conversation with Christopher Hitchens on this edition of Texas Monthly Talks. Christopher Hitchens, welcome. Very nice of you to have me. Happy to have you here in the rodeo buckle of the Bible Belt. Don't believe in any such thing. You don't? No. So do you, you don't feel outnumbered or outmanned coming to a place like Texas where they say people of faith are in great numbers? It certainly wouldn't bother me to be the only atheist in the country, but right. I don't believe any of the so-called findings about this. Why is that? Well, from experience. I mean, 80% of Americans or so report to the opinion pollsters that they go to church regularly on Sunday. They don't. They lie. I tell you how I know that. Stand in the middle of any town of any size in the country at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. It's not 20% full. Right. There aren't enough churches in any case to take that many Americans. It's easy enough to lie to an opinion pollster about a matter of faith. Um, and people think that's what they ought to be saying. It's one of the ways the religious get things too much their own way. Is. That everyone's on their side and in their corner. They're not. People like Robertson and Falwell are widely regarded as complete clowns. Someone like Al Sharpton, who I debated in New York, is a charlatan, a mountebank. It's a disgrace. But, but it, is, it does remain the fact that such a man would not get away with this in our culture if he wasn't called reverend. People like this say they demand respect for their faith. Why are they not getting it from me? Now, we, we know that this book is selling. It's going to be number three, I understand, when it uh, debuts on the New York Times bestseller list next week. Mm -hmm. And it is, as of this morning, number two among all sellers on Amazon, behind only the 
not yet released Harry Potter book. So clearly, <laughs> there are people who are buying this book. And number one in nonfiction, if I may say it myself. You may say it yourself. Um, but, but still, this is a book that... And it's not because of my blue eyes. Oh. I know what you were going to say. <laughs> it, uh, but it, it's, it's, no, it's because, in common with some predecessor books by Professor Dawkins, Sam Harris, right. Professor Janet Mills, it's part of a, what we were just discussing, a feeling of annoyance at the prevalence of religious bullying and intimidation. Everyone in this studio, including yourself, has been subject to a fatwa, okay, by Mr. Bin Laden and his associates, and we've all been told that he wants us dead. Uh, that should be enough to get people alarmed. And th that they mean it can't be doubted. You can see how they've managed to reduce the civil society in Iraq, the parties of God, nearly to a state of barbarism now. They say God gave them permission to do it. We say, what an extraordinary thing to be saying, don't we? we say, how, how can anyone believe a thing like that? Well, that's my question. But is that How not can the, anyone believe that they, they're doing what God wants them to do? Is that not the outlier, though, honestly? There are people of faith who, <coughs> who do not <coughs> uh, seek to kill other people or seek to divide their communities or their societies the way that the people you're describing do. Well, I'm not a person of faith, but I seek to kill the enemies of civilization. And I, and I, I tell you what, I think it's immoral to tell me to love them. But, but, but it's, I, I repeat, it yeah. is immoral, uh, as is much of Christian doctrine, to command me to love these people. To the contrary, it should, it should help to organize and discipline and make colder and more rational mm -hmm. one's hatred of them and determination to be rid of them. Well, the ones who wish uh, harm to you, I understand. But if, if people of faith are of no consequence to you, if they leave you alone, they don't think much it's about the you. the one definition that they can't meet. Right, which is? The, uh, the, the, I am a person of faith who will leave you alone. It's not, it's not in them. They, how can it be? Uh, they say, God cares <laughs> with whom I have sex for example. They have to interfere in my life. Mm -hmm. um, some of them say God cares what I eat. They have to interfere in my life. Some say God would mind what books I read. They have to interfere. Others will say it may be more compassionate. Well, they can't watch me go to hell. They have to intervene to stop that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be my friend. Mm -hmm. They'll love me to death if they have to. Right. The one thing they cannot do is leave me alone. Hence the book. Hence the argument. No, I, I, if someone said to me, look, I'll tell you what, Christopher, you and I are not quite the same. Um, I say, well, how is that? So, well, my mother bore me, but, but didn't have sex with a man before that. And I said, I had no idea. He said, well, how fascinating. Um, he said, well, it's, you see, it's like this. Because of that, you have to do what I say. That proves all my opinions are correct. I said, well, hold on. This sounds very weird to me, and actually now it's rather nasty. Right. Well, that's what you're supposed to have to believe. If it were confined to them and people who believe what they believe and did not extend over to you. And in fact, there are probably people who would argue that what they believe doesn't necessarily have to extend over to you. Would you be okay with that? Uh, well, possibly, but I'll tell you what else would happen. Right. Um, they'd start fighting among themselves. It's not they won't leave me alone, they won't leave people of other faiths alone. Most of the murder and torture and killing that goes on in Iraq is of, is of two discrepant kinds of Muslim slaughtering right. each other's families. The same is true in India. M m a Muslim on Hindu in the Balkans, Catholic versus Orthodox Christians, and then combining to murder the local Muslims. Um, we all get dragged into these terrible wars of faith. No, of course they won't leave us alone. They've gravely retarded civilization for hundreds of years. They're still doing it. There's no, no possibility of living a life that's untouched by this barbaric belief. Well, again, let me talk about outliers and non-outliers. Is there a hierarchy in your mind? Certain faiths are more problematic to you in terms of that argument than others? Well, my daughter goes to a Quaker school, for example, my youngest daughter in Washington. They teach non-resistance to evil, which I regard as an evil doctrine, but I don't regard it as evil as the preaching of evil is, right. shall we say. So if I'm told, well, do you mean that someone who's a member of the Society of Friends is the same as someone who supports the Ayatollah Khomeini? No, I don't. Of course not. But they all make the same mistake, which is to praise the idea of faith over, and to elevate it over reason and evidence and to say... On the most important thing of all, which is why are we here, what are we to do, what is the meaning of our life, on the most important questions, they say that it's very important to decide it without evidence, that you must make an unprovable assertion, and then demand respect for it. Well, I think the sleep of reason brings forth monsters. Why do you send your daughter to a Quaker school, if I may ask? Well, I would have sent her to a Hebrew school. Her, her, I, my mother was Jewish, and so was her mother. But if the education was as good... The French school in Washington is considered a very good school. I would send it to a Catholic school if it, was, if it had higher standards. Why not to a public school? Uh, you can't do that in Washington, in Washington I'm really sorry to say. I mean, I, know, I hate to say it, but I can't use Antonia for a social experiment. Do you take on the, the brand of faith that she's being exposed to at that school personally? Do you challenge the people there? 
N- no, I don't have to. No, I, it's thought. I mean, if they wanted an argument, they could get one. Yeah, but I, I don't want my children to have any knowledge directly of what my opinions are. Be drawn not. into this debate. No, they'll find it out for themselves. Right. You you attended a, a religious school when you were a child. Well, you have no choice in my country of birth. Right. Uh, it's religion is compulsory in, in schools. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, uh, I t- went to a Methodist boarding school. Yeah. T- tell uh, the audience and the viewing audience about your first experience of this, this M- Mrs. Watts. Oh, Mrs. Watts. This is when I was even younger at a Church of England boarding school for boys, mainly boys whose p- parents were in the armed forces like mine, who were travelling overseas. And we had Mrs. Watts, who was a lovely old lady, a widow, childless widow, fond of children, which I couldn't say for all my teachers. And she took us for nature walks, studying the beautiful part of Devon, southwest England, where I'm from. I, birds, trees, plants, flowers. And then she instructed us in what was called divinity, the scriptures, which I loved. I used to really like looking up the texts and then working out where, where the story had come from and what the parallels were in other uh, books of the Bible. And indeed in the between the Old and New Testament. I enjoyed it very It was my first effort as a literary critic, I now realize. And the language of the King James Bible and the Cranmer Prayer Book is very important to me. One day, though, Mrs. Watts went too far. She tried to marry her role as nature teacher and scripture teacher, and she said, Children, you see how God is good. He's made all the vegetation a lovely green color, which is the color most restful to our eyes. And imagine how horrible our lives would be if it was all purple or orange all the time. And I was nine, I think, and I thought, can I say this on your show? That's A child could see through this. Of course that's not true. So she's claiming to know more than she possibly could. Then I noticed, well, I, and I thought, well, why would she? And I thought, well, I can see why that would be, because the same as the headmaster. If he appears in front of us holding the Bible every morning, it gives him authority in the real world, the here and now, never mind the hereafter. Who wouldn't? If they could enhance their power by pretending to be doing God's work, who wouldn't do it? Mm-hmm. So I was getting the essential information in my cortex oh. at quite a young age. Is that the moment that you identified yourself first as an atheist? Wouldn't have known the word. Right. Wouldn't have known. At what word. point did you embrace that term? I certainly had. That's how I know the feeling that many people have that they're the only one. They're surprised to find that millions of people have had similar experiences, as we all have. Mm-hmm. But uh, I started then to object to being made to pray, and I, used to, I found it anyway objectionable to be told, to forced to say every morning that I was a wretched, worthless sinner. I thought, what is Even this? Even though you may have been. Even though this, the possibility exists, it could right. be true. Well, here's the, here's the paradox of it, and I think it's a very unwholesome one. You're told first that you're made of nothing but the dust of the earth, and that you're, you're born into sin and corruption, and, and you've committed, a, a crimes were committed by you before you were born. you stuck with this, so you're saturated in guilt and shame as a little boy. But there's a compensating factor. The universe is designed with you in mind. After all, you are terribly important. You can be the most egomaniacal person you like, after all, completely self-centered. The universe was designed in, with you in mind, and God has a plan for you. That makes up for it a bit. Both of these claims are highly unhealthy as well as utterly untrue. And in conflict? Well, I think one is designed as a compensation for the other. Is that what it is? Yes, I think so. Right. Uh, you terrify somebody. It's sadomasochism. You, ter- you terrify somebody first, and you say, ah, now I've, really, now I've really shaken you and upset you and given you bad dreams and told you about hell. So here's this other thing. I've got a real secret. As long as you'll transfer your money to my church and as long as you'll agree to do as I say on a number of other things, that's fine. Right. Well, th- I think this is positively immoral. I think it's actually actively wicked, as well as palpably false. So there was no point at which you played the game. At no point did you sort of test this out, dip your toe in the water, say, well, let me see if I feel like this is for me. So you were not someone who tried out various faiths or one faith and then rejected it. No, nothing yeah. like that. No, right. no, no. I mean, I, I studied them all, right. I, and I still do. And it's still, to me, a great department of learning, right. because it's what precedes philosophy. Mm-hmm. Philosophy starts where religion ends, but you have to know where the, where the break point comes. You make a distinction in the book. I don't know that it's a distinction exactly, but you use the terms differently. Religion is one, but God worship is a phrase that I found interesting in the book. Explain the difference or tell me there's no difference well, between the two. I should perhaps underscore the distinction better. Yeah. I mean, you can, like my um, subject of biography, I'm a biographer in a small way of Thomas Jefferson. Right. He was a deist in that he thought that there must be or have been a creator. Right. Very common opinion in the late 18th century, early 19th century. 
the order and majesty of the universe, the rhythms of nature, this can't just be a chemical reaction, or it must be a designer. But he didn't think that designer cared about or intervened in human affairs. So he believed in God, but he was not really religious. Deism is not a religion. Right. It still seems logical to many people that there must be a designer. But it's a huge step to say the designer cares what you eat or who you go to bed with. And because, why is it such a huge step? Because you have to claim to know the mind of God. Now, I, I know this much. I know that nobody does know that. Okay. I'm a mammal. I've never met another mammal who I think of as um, able to make that claim. I've met mammals much smarter than myself. And you've met mammals who have claimed to be able to make that claim. I, the place is rife with mammals who claim to be able to make that claim. <laughs> right. so it's, it seems to be a mammalian weakness to say, not only do I know that God exists, but I happen to be able to inform you what he would now like you to do. And furthermore, since I'm acting for him, I'm the one who's going to tell you. Right. I say, no, just hold it right there. I w will not be, put as politely as possible, spoken to in that tone of voice by anybody. You've been described actually as an atheist, but also as an anti-theist. It's my self-definition. Self-definition. Yes. So is there a similar distinction there? No, it's just a refinement, if you like. Right. Um, you could be an atheist and wish it were otherwise. Right. I think well, I've certainly met people who say they wish it were true. They tried to believe it. They just couldn't make themselves. It's, it flies in the face of so much contrary evidence. Right. And there's no evidence on its side. So you know, pity about that, but can't believe it. I don't see it's a pity at all, because... If it were true that there was a divine, celestial, um, all-powerful person who kept me under constant invigil invigilation, supervision, surveillance from the moment I was conceived until, well, forever, because I, don't, I can't escape from him even by dying. That's when the fun really begins. You get the option of going to somewhere which, when I was even quite small, I th paradise, I mean, that sounded to me like hell, a place of eternal praise of someone who had only done his job by creating you. But right. you had to keep thanking him forever. Sounds like hell to me. Or worse, <laughs> eternal torment for a crime you probably hadn't known at the time you were even committing. Right. This is the, these are the origins of totalitarianism. This, this is a wish... For, these are the, these are the is, choices that you're this being... This is a made wish made. for unending slavery. Right. Now, I don't share it. And I'm very, therefore, I'm very relieved that, that there is no evidence right. for it, no reason to believe it's true. I want to talk about Iraq here in a second, but I want to ask mm. about Salman Rushdie first, which may be an interesting uh, a segue. You, are, uh, you consider Rushdie a good friend, and he considers yes. you a good friend, and you were actually quite moved to, to speak out when the fatwa, the liberal fatwa against Salman Rushdie was, was ordered. And it, that was a pretty significant moment in terms of your view of religion, yep. was it not? It was my 9-11, if you like, yeah. 14th of February 1989. Explain. Well, on that day, Valentine's Day, 1989, it doesn't really matter that he was a friend of mine. I'm proud to say that he, he was and remains one. Remember exactly what happened. The theocratic head, dictator of a foreign state, the Ayatollah Khomeini, appears in public to offer money in his own name, without disguise, for the suborning of murder. Pretty extraordinary thing for a religious leader to do. Mm. For the crime of writing a work of fiction, directed at someone who isn't even an Iranian, who lives in London. Now, this is a pretty frontal assault on everything that I believe in and value. Free expression, free inquiry, the right of the individual to be free of state terror, all of this. And um, I thought, it was the first time I thought, well, they're trying to change our regime, our society. Well, they mustn't be allowed to do that. But further than that, we better have to change theirs. And you, we and can't you, put up with this. Yeah. That was for a later time. At the time, I noticed another thing. Okay, here you have on the one side free expression, the liberty of the individual, the right of free inquiry, the right of literary production. On the other, superstition, murder, the offer of, of gain for murder. And, of course, a ticket to paradise, naturally, thrown in and an offer of virgins to young men who mostly, as far as I can see, actually are virgins. Sick, repressed young men who've, been, who've had their sex lives ruined by religion as well as everything else. Okay, pretty horrible. Um, where are the churches coming out on this? Well, the Pope said the problem was Salman Rushdie had committed blasphemy. The Archbishop of Canterbury said the problem was Salman Rushdie had committed blasphemy. The Chief Rabbi of Israel said the problem was Salman Rushdie had committed blasphemy. They all lined up, in effect, with the Ayatollah. So that's also my, part of my answer to your question was, you know, I shouldn't judge religion by its fringe adherence. Right. 
Let, let me ask about Iraq in the remaining time we have left. You have very famously been a supporter of the uh, of the war and mm. have uh, refused in the face of uh, criticism and uh, of people who were like you, supporters of the war, backing down. You've refused to change your position. <clears throat> you are you continue to be a supporter of the war. I think Iraq is a keystone state right. to which we owe a large number of debts, partly because of past policy errors going back through several administrations, mm -hmm. that it would be absolutely unthinkable to abandon the Iraqi people to Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, that mm -hmm. they demonstrate every day what would happen to the Iraqis if we withdrew, and to ourselves. It seems to me elementary. I prefer to say the word uh, struggle rather than war. It's a struggle between my Iraqi and Kurdish friends, or rather my Arab and uh, Kurdish Iraqi friends, and their allies, that's us, their friends, that's you and me, I hope, against barbarism. Call it a struggle. Saying stop the war sounds better, means you're anti-war, which is sort of okay. But if you just change it by one word, and not very much, what it says is surrender. It's not worth fighting over. Let the other side win. Well, we, 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 have, nothing worth, we have nothing worth defending. Um, this, is, this is moral and political suicide. What people would say, though, is that it's not so much end the struggle, it's end... Again, putting words in their mouth, admittedly, but end the um, the deaths of American soldiers on behalf of a cause that is of questionable interest. Now, I know you disagree with this, but is of questionable national interest to this country. You disagree. Well, they may want the struggle to be bloodless, but then they should have picked another enemy. Or they should have found a nicer one than Al Qaeda to be fighting. No. You, you believe? They that want, the, oh, wait a minute. I mean, you see, see the incoherence of what I know. You're not speaking in your own words, but if suppose that was someone's position, see how incoherent it would be. The same people say it's a distraction from the fight against Al-Qaeda. It is the fight against Al-Qaeda. Giving al Anbar province to Al-Qaeda is not taking part in the struggle against Al-Qaeda. It's capitulating to Al-Qaeda. If you want to fight against Al-Qaeda and not have any unpleasant bloodshed, then maybe you should pick some other enemy to have. But this one seems to have picked us. And I expect the fight to be going on for the rest of my life. And I expect people to get killed in it a lot. When, when, but I want yeah. the, uh, be the United States Armed Forces, who playing this exemplary role in Iraq, yeah. are getting better and better and better at reducing our casualties and increasing theirs. And that's what I like to see. And I want those two graphs to get even sharper than they are now. When, when, when critics of your point of view say, but al-Qaeda was involved in 9-11 and Iraq wasn't, and yet we chose to fight in Iraq as opposed to in Afghanistan. Well, we, excuse where, me, you went first to Afghanistan and cleaned out the Taliban. Right, but there are those who would say that uh, we didn't finish the job in Afghanistan, and actually the Al-Qaeda and Taliban have come back in greater numbers in Afghanistan than before the invasion, or, as, or equal numbers, and that, in fact, Al-Qaeda was not in Iraq until we began the war. Again, that, that's the popular criticism. Yeah, of, I know. Uh, I, I don't know how people believe it's in the face of all the evidence. Yeah. First, we did clean out the Taliban from from uh, Afghanistan. If they're not all gone, it's because, unfortunately, our supposed ally Pakistan has a long common border with Afghanistan and is never going to let its former clients completely go out of business. But they, they can't get Afghanistan back. We can completely stop them from doing that. In Iraq, we know very well that the, the leading uh, ghoul of al-Qaeda, um, Mr. Zakawi, was in Baghdad well before that. And if you look even at Mr. Tenet's book, a man who dislikes the whole operation and if, who never wanted us to go to Iraq in the first place. And you don't seem to have much respect for him. None, whatever. I can't believe he was ever the head of anything, let alone of a national intelligence service. But he says yeah. in his book, you know, the alarming, really truly alarming signs of increasing cooperation between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden just could not any longer be ignored, unless you were willing to face the American people later and say, well, perhaps I should have paid attention. The, the position that bin Laden and, and, and Hussein were in any way allied is one you acknowledge is in dispute. There are people who disagree about that. There no, there, no, there's no disagreement about it. There's only disagreement about the extent of it. We don't know if it rose to the level of operational uh, cooperation or not. Well, i tell you one thing. It, if, if it was up to me, it never would. Mm -hmm. The regime that was flirting with it would cease to exist. Go, gone. Would, would we the not president have, who didn't do that would have, should, should have been impeached. Would we not have been better off killing bin Laden as opposed to moving off of bin Laden and getting on to Hussein? No, we had an appointment with Saddam Hussein anyway. Remember, the, uh, both houses voted under the Clinton administration in 98. Uh, I think without demur for the Iraq Liberation Act, that it shall be the policy of the United States of America to remove the Saddam Hussein regime anyway. 9-11 mm -hmm. is essentially irrelevant to this. It only makes it more urgent. Right. And, and you, you wrote on uh, Slate one of And that was partly know. because of his consistent and up until then uh, un, unwaveringly consistent this, uh, use of Baghdad as a place of hospitality for, for Abu Nidal, uh, for Abu Abbas, the man who killed uh, Klinghoffer, 
uh, for his, his financing of the Islamic Jihad suicide bombers in Palestine. Yeah. All, all of that was undisputed as well. The idea that he wouldn't go near the next most lethal uh, anti-American force in the region is on its own face absurd. Well, we're out of time. I have a lot more to talk about on mm. Iraq. I wish we had longer, but I appreciate Me very too. much your being here. Thank you very much, for the, and, and congratulations on the book, and, and good luck with your tour. Very nice of you to Thank you, me. Christopher Hitchens. Appreciate it. Mucho gusto. Uh Funding for Texas Monthly Talks is provided in part by Public Strategies Incorporated, managing campaigns for corporations around the clock, around the world, and J.P. Morgan Chase, the state's largest financial institution, serving large and small businesses, governments, schools, churches, and individual Texans just like you for more than 135 years, and the MFI Foundation, improving the quality of life within our community and the Matson McHale Foundation in support of public television. And also by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, proud to be a founding partner of Texas Monthly Talks. And by the law firm and public policy practice of Vincent and Elkins, LLP, providing legislative, regulatory, and public finance counsel for complex business challenges. Vincent and Elkins, online at VELaw.com. And viewers like you, thank you.